Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Come on in, have a seat. I'm glad that you're here today. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I hope that you had a, a really, really nice week and uh, that you experienced the Lord's blessings. Just a couple of uh, quick things. First of all, we had a, a really, really awesome Thanksgiving dinner on uh, Thursday. Uh, those that came, I think we had 22 here, and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. We had a great time together, and uh, everybody who came seemed to really enjoy it, and uh, we played some games and have, had some fun. It was, it was great. So uh, I want to thank those who worked hard to prepare the meal. It was a great meal, and hopefully all of you had a great time time together as well. We have so much to be thankful for, don't we? So, so very much to be thankful for. If I could, uh, if we just spent one service just giving thanks to the Lord, we'd be here till Jesus comes, I think, and never exhaust the reasons to be thankful. This afternoon at four o'clock, we're going to have our hanging of the greens. Uh, always a fun time. Bring your leftovers if you want to, if you want to get rid of them. Um, and uh, and um, uh, we'll decorate the sanctuary for Christmas. Uh, it's always a fun time when we get together uh, on the, the Sunday after Thanksgiving to decorate the sanctuary and, and uh, put the trees up and just get, just uh, uh, create a, a wonderful Christmas winter fun land here in, in the, the sanctuary. So uh, we won't have a prayer and praise time tonight like we normally do on Sunday night uh, because we will be uh, having that uh, Thanksgiving, um, I, I mean the, the hanging of the greens. I uh, want to also once again congratulate our kids who uh, won second place in the children's quizzing, the Bible quizzing, won second place in the state, and they got some Bible memory awards and um, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, medals and so on, so they, they did really, really good. Our Safe Haven Christmas program is Monday, December the uh, 7th. Uh, we are limiting the number of people that uh, can come, but if you would, if you really, really would like to come, uh, let Teresa know, and we'll make sure. But we are limiting only to immediate families uh, because of the COVID thing. We'll put out lots of chairs so that the families can kind of spread apart. Um, and I think we're going to even require that they wear masks, I think. Isn't that correct? So, uh, but if you would like to come and see that ch uh, children's Christmas program for uh, Safe Haven, then uh, that's Monday night, December the, the 7th. Our own children's Christmas program is going to be December the 13th. The kids are in the back right now already practicing and uh, getting ready for that. So uh, you won't be seeing much of the kids until that particular Sunday uh, when they present. And I saw a little bit of it here during the Sunday. Sunday school hour, they are doing great. It's going to be a great program, great message uh, for the uh, for very, very timely message for uh, our world and uh, and for God's people. I want to continue to uh, uh, thank you for your faithful giving. And uh, if you do have an offering, then you can place it in the box in the back. It will be over here on this side as you leave through those doors uh, in the back. Speaking of Thanksgiving offering, Ronnie, you want to share real quick, today's the day. Uh, some of you have already been giving that uh, uh, Thanksgiving offering for World evangelism, setting a place at the table and giving that amount to world evangelism. Do you have anything you want to share about that? Well, the whole thing about it is, is if you stopped and you took a minute to say, okay, thank you for this particular meal. So anyway, if you do, just go ahead and put it in an envelope and put it in the back. And then we'll let you know how much came in next yep. week. So anyway, we'll just see. But we do want to thank the Lord for all the things that he's given us. And so we thank God for that. Very good. So the Thanksgiving offering is doing it, did it a little bit different this year by uh, uh, setting a place at the table. If you have a cup of coffee or if you have a, a go out for a, a meal, then you uh, provide a meal for Jesus, so to speak, and set that money aside. And uh, so we'll see uh, how that, we'll let you know how that went. Our Work and Witness project is coming up in March. It's going to come here quicker than you know. Uh, if you'd like to help sponsor somebody, you can give towards that work and witness project uh, to our Native American Christian Academy up in Holbrook. We'll be heading up there March the 6th through the 12th. I think we have, how many team members do we have so far? Anybody know? 
20? 16 team members. Isn't that great? 16 team members that are going to be going up, and uh, so that's going to be an exciting time. Guess whose birthday is today? David. Right there in the back. Today is David Wells' birthday, and he already shared with me what he got for his birthday. It was awesome. So let's sing happy birthday to David Wells. Can we do that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. It's good that he's even here because he's been up all night long as a uh, paramedic and working the ambulance crew, and he came uh, without sleep. So uh, it's good that he's here today. Be sure to thank him for his service. Thank all of our nurses and, and medical folks and firefighters um, who uh, are uh, uh, out there on the job. Praise the Lord. Well, I guarantee you what? Um, let's, let's give thanks to the Lord. Can we do that? Let's just give thanks to the Lord. Watch this video. It didn't work. It's not working. Stand with me and let's sing to the Lord. that Amen. praise the lord you may be seated how many of you would say that this has been probably the craziest year of your life <laughs> this has really been a remarkable unforgettable uh unprecedented year i think watch this video well 
um, it has been an unprecedented year. Crazy. With all the, the... This stuff? Yeah. It's unprecedented how many times we've actually heard the word unprecedented. <laughs> <laughs> Our dream vacation was canceled. You got to keep the job you don't like. You know they can see you? Well, let me tell you all the no's, friends. Um, no going to restaurants, no movie theaters, no movie theater popcorn, no state parks, no going to athletic events, no church services, and no... Don't say it. Don't. Hey, kids! You've got to be more careful with the toilet paper! This is all we have! All the drive-by birthday parties, graduations, <laughs> baby showers. I will say this, I felt a little awkward throwing out that baby shower gift in the front yard. You weren't supposed to do that. It just feels like a wasted year. I said it, I said it. There's, there's just all the time at home. Boom! And all the time that we were made to spend together. Hey, honey! Goodness. Speaking of hearts, our son, Jason, right over there, said yes to Jesus. All right, that kitchen table. July 17th, 2020. You know, I guess it's not really wasted time because God didn't waste a moment of it. <laughs> I think I have the answer to what I'm thankful for. Yeah? Yeah. What is it? Everything. That pretty much sum it up? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? But even in spite of the difficulties and the hardships, we have so much to be thankful for to the Lord. So, so much. Our salvation, the life that he gives us, regardless of the things that happen. Aren't you glad for the Lord and what he's done for us? The air that we breathe, so much. We have so much. And, and Scripture says, in all things, give thanks to the Lord. And the Scripture says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's worship the Lord, shall we? And give him the thanks today. I come before you today. And there's just one thing that I want to say. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've given to me. For all the blessings that I cannot see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart.
Lord God, we're so grateful to you today. We want to offer our thanks to you. If it weren't for you and what you have done for us, we would be hopelessly lost. For all eternity, we'd be hopelessly lost, Lord. But you have loved us. You have given your life to save us. And even if we had nothing of this world's pleasure, Lord, we would be grateful and thankful to you. We want to offer our thanks to you today and give you the praise. thank the Lord the most is saving us. I want you to once again think of this. Even if you had nothing of this world's pleasure or nothing of the things or the comforts of this world, the one thing that we can be the most thankful for is that God so loved us that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So even if we went through this life with nothing, we would be with the Lord for all eternity because of what Jesus did for us. The one thing that we can thank God the most for is saving us from sin, changing us from death to life, and giving us that great hope that we have Give your thanks to the Lord this morning, if nothing else, for your salvation. And give him the glory. Let's sing it to you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul.
that saving grace and they're living in sin and they're living in a state of hopelessness and we're seeing the sin being lived out in the streets of Portland and in the streets of Seattle and in the way people are behaving we see that sin nature being lived out right before our very eyes the hatred the division the brokenness the broken families all just keeps going on and on and on because of that sin and that fallenness from God. There is only one thing that will change the human heart, and that is faith in Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith and having God change the heart from within. There are people all around us who desperately need the Lord. They need to know Jesus there's only one way that we're going to see transformed lives. And that can't come through human endeavor. It has to come through faith in Jesus and repentance of sin and restoration. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. But then the scriptures go on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. People need the Lord in order to be saved, in order to be transformed. People need the Lord, and we who have been saved need to develop that passion for the Lord once again, that passion for the lost, crying out to God for the sake of the lost, or we'll continue to see sin advanced in this world until Jesus comes and judgment falls. We have got to come back to praying and crying out to God for the sake of the lost. Listen to this, the words of this great song as Ronnie sings, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will fall on you once again with a tremendous passion for people to, to turn back to God. Sing on the chorus when we come to it with us, Ronnie. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where Living fear to fear 
sharing life with one who's lost. Through his love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life that only is the answer to the deepest human need, the deepest need of every heart. Jesus is the answer. We must realize that Jesus is the answer for people. Let's sing it out with, with all of the passion that we have within us. May the Holy Spirit ramp that up within us once again, that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the
praised and honored in this service today and may we honor the Lord in our hearts and in our lives well I'm excited to share with you what the Lord has for us today by the way I wanted to let you know that uh, in the back are the new uh, winter devotionals uh, so you've got three months worth of devotionals daily devotionals starting this coming Sunday so take advantage of that. Starts December the 1st. Be sure to take, we, we've had plenty of them for, uh, for each family. So don't forget to pick up your winter devotionals uh, in the back. Praise the Lord. We're looking at the, um, uh, the basic Bible studies these days to help us to know how then we can lead somebody else in their new journey as they have become Christians. How many of you brought your devotional today, number six? How many, anybody need one? You need one, okay? Can I have a usher to help out? And, and if you don't have a packet, I have packets available here as well. Anybody that does not have a packet, okay? All right, let me give, here's three packets. I want to make sure that everybody has one of these because we are going through this together and uh, making sure that we are armed and equipped. Okay? Go ahead and give a couple of packets here to these guys over here, too. Uh, these, I, I don't know these people. They're in the front row there. They're, they're kind of strangers there. Huh? One more. I want to make sure that everybody has these and that you are very familiar with them because my passion and my desire is that we are equipped and ready to go in order to not only lead somebody to faith in Jesus, but also to disciple them. So that's what we're doing these days. I envision a day when this church family is so excited about Jesus, so filled with the Spirit of God that they just can't help but share the gospel with people, not only know not only know how to share the gospel, I gave you three different ways, and there are many other ways of sharing the gospel, but also to help people to know how to lead them in their spiritual journey once they become new, newly born in Christ. Newborn, like Jesus said, you must be born again. So you have a brand new baby in Christ. They need to know, okay, what now? What's next? What do I do now? And it's so important that we be equipped to know how to lead somebody, and this is a great tool. So we've covered, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. Those are our marching orders. If we're not doing this, then we're not fulfilling the Great Commission, period. Can I say that? Don't, I, I don't even need to ask you. If we are not doing this, if we are not making disciples and teaching them, then we're not fulfilling the Great Commission. We're not doing the mission of the church that Jesus clearly gave to the church. So I'm adamant about this in these days, and I still say that the answer to the deepest human need is Jesus Christ and following Jesus. Now, we can say we believe that, but if we're not practicing and, and, and doing, then there might be something wrong with our faith. If we're not actually adamantly sharing Jesus with others, if we really believe that he is the deepest 
the best, the greatest answer to the deepest need of the human heart, then we will do our best to be praying for our unsaved loved ones and uh, neighbors and friends uh, and, and praying for our neighbors. I gave you that uh, program where you can be praying for your neighbors by name. And we just need to do everything we can. So, so far we've covered Bible study number one, your new life in Christ, to uh, when a person becomes a brand new believer, the first one helps them to understand what happened. What happened when I accept Jesus as my Savior? What happened to me? And then walking with God, teaching them how to practice the Christian faith each and every day. And then the importance of the Word of God in their lives. This is one of the greatest problems that we have in the church around the world is people call themselves Christians, but they have no idea what is in the, the basic instructions before leaving earth, the Bible. They don't, they don't have any clue. So we need to teach them that not only do we need to be in the Word, but we need to teach that new believer they must be in the Word each and every day of their lives because this is our spiritual food. We will die spiritually if we don't feed ourselves with the Word of God. We will become spiritually anemic, and this is what's happening in our world today, and this is the reason why we're seeing what we're happening in our world today, is because people do not know the Word of God. And then talking with God, the importance of prayer. I can't emphasize enough the importance that you spend time with the Lord each day, just like Jesus did, and praying and, and, and listening to the voice of God through His Word and through His Spirit within you. Developing a prayer life is vital to the Christian life, and you need to help that new believer to understand that right from the earliest time. And then sharing with God. We've all been given special spiritual gifts, and so we share with God our lives. We owe our lives to God when He saves us and redeem, uh, redeems us. We, we owe our time and our talents and our treasure to the Lord, and we share with the Lord. Today, we're going to be talking about telling others about God, telling others about God, and the importance of sharing the gospel with others. So let's begin. Can you remember the last time that you got great news? Did you have trouble keeping it to yourself? When something great happens, you might find yourself telling complete strangers the good news. Have you ever done that? Witnessing is telling others what Christ has done for you. It is sharing the good news of God. Once Christ has entered your life, you should want to share his love with everyone. When you experience the love of God and you realize how desperately that God loves you and sacrificed for you, and you experience that forgiveness and that love of God, it changes your heart, and you want to share that love with everyone. So let's look at the first one. Christ's healing of the demon-possessed man was followed by a specific command. When, when Jesus healed that demon-possessed man, okay, so we we're looking for a, a definition of the word witness. What possible definition of the word witness do you find in Luke 8.39? Luke 8.39 says, return home and tell how much God has done for you. This is what Jesus said to the demon-possessed man. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So what possible witness definition of the, of the word witness do you find here? What does the word say? Tell how much God has done for you. Telling people how much God has done for you is a good definition of witness. How many of you remember uh, a show and tell in school? Okay. You brought something and uh, you stood in front of the class and you told everybody all about it. You know, it might be something really special that you just loved. And so you told everybody about it, about all about it. You described it. 
you described it well. The Greek word used here uh, to tell everyone about it literally means to describe it. Describe, declare. So you describe in detail how much God has done for you. Number two, John's gospel teaches much about witnessing. Based on John 3.32, to witness or to testify is to share what? Okay, John 3.32 says, uh, 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 I, I thought I put the scripture in there, but I guess I didn't, okay? So what you have been taught to be the truth, what you've heard from someone else, or what you've seen and heard yourself. There's, there it is. He testified to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. So the answer is, based on John 3.32, to witness is, and to share is what? What you have personally seen and heard. You can't testify to something that hasn't happened. You can try to make it up, but if it's not real, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's something that personally happened in your heart, and you tell others about it. What was Andrew doing in John 1, 40 to 41? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So what do we find Andrew doing in John 1, 40 to 41? He told his brother, we found the Messiah. And that's what witnessing is, isn't it? I found the answer. I found the Messiah. I found Jesus. Jesus changed my heart. Jesus changed my life. He, he, he transformed my heart and my life. And what did, what did Andrew do? He brought his brother to Jesus. And that's what witnessing is. It's bringing people to Jesus. Amen? What did Jesus say that God wants Christians to do? What does is, what is God want Christians to do, according to John 28 and 29? Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Remember, the, uh, uh, in many religions around the world, it's salvation by works. What do I do? Is there something that I must do? Okay? Nearly every religion in the world is based on what we do. But Christianity is something co completely different. Okay? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So what is important for us to help that new Christian or help anyone? Help them to believe in Jesus too. Amen? Help them believe in Jesus too. So what did Jesus say that God wants Christians to do? Believe. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the one that God has sent. Praise the Lord. What is the work that he tells you to do in John 15, 16? John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you will go and what? Bear fruit, fruit that will last. Bear fruit. Be fruitful in your Christian life. So what is the work that he tells you to do? Not just believe, but also to bear fruit. Now, we could say that that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the gentleness, the kindness, the self-control, all of these things that the Holy Spirit does in us. But by, but by bearing fruit, don't you think that your life will also be a witness to others? So we bear that fruit. Is the world very loving these days? Pretty hateful, isn't it? So where should people see that love of God? In us. What about the patience, the gentleness, 
okay? The goodness, the kindness, the self-control. One of the things the Bible says in the, in the end times is that people will be without self-control. We're seeing that these days, aren't we? People have no zipper on their mouth. They don't have any zipper on their actions. They just do, okay? But where should people be seeing? They should be seeing the fruits of the Spirit in the church, in the people of God. Thus, we become witnesses. We become salt and light in this world. So the, we are to not only believe that Jesus is the answer, but bear that fruit in our lives. Praise the Lord. I am the vine, Jesus said. You are the branches. If you remain in me, this, this is extra. It's not in there. I am the vine, Jesus said. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will do what? you will bear fruit. If the Spirit of Christ is within you and you are in Him and He is in you, your life will bear that fruit that He is real. And remember, you can't witness to something that's not real. You can't be a witness if it's not real within you. So it's important that we remain in him and his spirit be fully in us. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciple. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Folks, let me tell you something. When the spirit of God is within you, it's going to come out somehow. It's going to come out through your heart somehow. The spirit of Jesus in us produces that fruit. We cannot bear fruit apart from an intimate, personal relationship with the Lord each and every day. We need to allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to get into our hearts, and then we will bear much fruit. God is glorified when we bear that fruit. So here we go. Spiritually, what is the greatest thing that has ever happened to you? There's no scripture here. This is your testimony. This is your testimony. You put in here the greatest thing that has ever happened to you. Hopefully, it will be that Christ has changed your heart and your life. When you accepted him as your Savior, when you received and believed that Christ died on that cross for you so that you can be changed from death to life and from sin to righteousness and made holy, hopefully that is the greatest thing that has happened to you. Some people would say it's that brand new bow that I got for my birthday. I'm picking on you, Dave. <laughs> And that's a great thing. But there's one thing that doesn't ever wear out, and that is what Christ continually does in our hearts and in our lives. So it's testimony time. We're not going to take a lot of time, but does anybody have a testimony you want to share about what Jesus has done in you? Popcorn testimony. All right, moving right along. What is the greatest kindness that you can show another person then? The greatest thing that has happened to you, what is the greatest kindness that you can show another person? Here's testimony time again. The greatest kindness is sharing Jesus. Remember, a person can have all of the things of this world, and they can gain the whole world but lose their own soul, right? But if they have Jesus, they might not have anything in this world, but they have eternal life. They have a relationship, personal relationship with God, and their hearts are filled with love and grace and peace and joy. So the greatest kindness that we can ever do to someone else, beyond the food that we might give them or, the, or whatever that we might be able to do in this world, the greatest kindness is sharing Christ with someone. What does Jesus command you to do in Matthew 28? You already know the answer to that, don't you? We've been bearing down on it for several weeks now. The greatest command, the greatest, the, the command that Jesus gave the church is this. 
Jesus, when Jesus said, after he had already given his life on the cross and was raised from the dead, and he completed the work of God for our salvation, then Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, now listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. How many of you believe that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords? He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. How many of you believe that Christ is coming back someday and that he is going to reign and rule over all creation? Well, folks, he's reigning and ruling today, even now. Amen? It may not look like it, but trust me when I say God is still on the throne, and he knows exactly what's going on right now. Amen? And everything is working according to God's plan. Everything is working according to the plan of God. So he has all authority. Jesus even has authority over death itself. Even death itself he has authority over. Amen? Even death submits to Christ now. And so Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he said, therefore, church, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You know what the greatest victory uh, that there is in this world? When you see someone else come to Christ and they become a follower of Jesus too. That's the greatest victory of anything when they become a follower of Jesus as well. But he gave us a command and this is our marching orders. What does Jesus command you to do in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 then? go go he didn't say sit in the church and wait for them to come we're waiting we're waiting we're waiting for them to come we're still waiting that's not what the command is is it he didn't say you go to church on Sunday morning for an hour and that's all there is to your Christian life. Jesus said, go. Go and make disciples. We ought to be in the disciple-making business every day of our lives. Amen? If we're followers of Jesus, then we ought to be disciple-makers every single day of our lives, making disciples making followers of Jesus, leading people to faith in Jesus, helping them to become a follower of Jesus. Well, that ought to be the primary focus of every single one of our lives, making disciples and helping them to obey, helping them to come to know Christ and, and experience the sweet, the sweet spirit of a transformed heart and life. What event did early Christians participate in as evidence that they had accepted Christ? Okay? As evidence that they had accepted Christ. When they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were what? Baptized, both men and women. Okay? They were baptized. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Boy, wouldn't that be great if somebody comes up to you and say, I want you to baptize me and baptize me now. <laughs> Do it now. The Lord has transformed my heart and life. By the way, yeah, I'm not going to go there. That's, that's a whole different thing, but okay. Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, then you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. This eunuch was a very, very high-ranking individual. He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip, I imagine the servant that was with the eunuch was going, what in the world is going on? Okay. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, 
and Philip baptized him. Praise the Lord. Now, what was the command? Well, let me finish this up. What event did early Christians participate in as evidence that they had accepted Christ? They were baptized. How many of you believe that baptism is an important part of a new believer's walk with the Lord? Being baptized. There is tremendous significance in, in, the, uh, in, in the event of baptism. It is extremely meaningful. Whatever method, we, we kind of like the idea of total immersion because it's very meaningful. When a person accepts Christ as their Savior and, and they uh, give their lives up, if they die out to self and they are immersed in that water, kind of signifying that they're dying out to self and dying out to sin, and they're raised to new life in Jesus. And they begin a new walk with the Lord. But there are other ways of being baptized. I'm not going to say you have to do it one particular way. Okay? I've baptized 85-year-olds. Full immersion. <laughs> because they were so adamant that they wanted... Okay? But there are other ways. The point is, is that, is that outward uh, 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 display and witness of an inward work of grace. Being baptized is an important part of you helping that new believer to, to know that they have experienced salvation, God's saving grace. Have you made this public expression of your faith? If you haven't, I'll get the stock tank out and we'll go to work. All right? We'll set it up and we'll go to work, okay? Or in the river or in a creek somewhere. I've done it all. I baptized 14 up there at Black Canyon Lake here a few years ago. So, what, anyway, so have you made this expression of faith? Yes or no, or you're thinking about it, and then why or why not? Okay? Hopefully everybody can say, yep. Okay? But if you're thinking about it, let me know. We'll take care of it. What is the condition of those who do not believe in Christ? This is, folks, this is where the rubber meets the road. What is the condition? We need to get this into our hearts and understand this. According to John 3, 18, what is the condition of those who do not believe? John 3, 18 says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Hallelujah. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Folks, we need to understand this with all of our heart, that there are people out there who are walking and living already under God's condemnation. And we need to do something about it. We need to pray. We need to ask the Lord to please work in their hearts and transform them from death to life and experience his saving grace. So what is the condition of those who do not believe in Christ? They're already condemned. Now, it doesn't have to stay that way, does it? That's the good news. It doesn't have to stay that way. So what does God make abundantly available to people even before you witness to them? The Scripture says, but the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Folks, let me tell you something. The grace of God is available to all. It's already available to everyone who believe. So what is it that God makes abundantly available to people even before you witness to them? His grace. How many of you believe that God's saving grace can transform a heart from death to life and from sin to righteousness? Jesus died on that cross so that God can offer that forgiveness and grace to everyone. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes, whoever believes, and have everlasting life will not perish but have everlasting life if you are a faithful to follow christ what does 
he promised to do. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will what? Make you fishers of men. Follow me. So if you're faithful to follow Christ, what does he promise to do in you? He will make you a fisher of people. Okay? Now, I don't much like the word fishing. I like the word catching better. Right? Ronnie knows I, I'm not much of a fisherman. I even tried to lasso one one time and it wouldn't cooperate. But the point is, is the Lord does a work in your heart to create in you a hopefully a person who is so filled with the Spirit, you become the bait. You become the bait that people will come and want to know Jesus. According to 1 Peter 3.15, how can you be prepared to witness for Christ? 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Revere Christ as the Lord of your life and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. I could tell you a story about when I was living in Yuma and I was uh, pastoring the church in Yuma. And um, I was out working on my truck one day, and uh, I won't say who it is, but a person from a, uh, another church nearby came around, was knocking on doors and everything. And he was extremely belligerent. You ever met somebody like that? I'm sure he was passionate for the Lord, but he was belligerent. He tried to get me unsaved so that he can get me saved. And that was very offensive to me. He tried to get me unsaved. I shared with him that I'm a follower, I'm a faith, I love the Lord. I, Jesus died for my sins, and he rose again, and my faith is in Jesus, but he wouldn't buy it. He was so determined that he was going to get me unsaved so that he can stick a feather in his hat. You know, got me another one. Folks, we need to be gentle and loving and kind and compassionate with people. Amen? Not belligerent. Not belligerent with our faith. But let the Spirit of God work in our hearts and our hearts and our lives become the bait. Amen to that? with gentleness and respect. But, but here's the point of this answer. According to 1 Peter 3.15, how can you be prepared? Well, the best way, folks, to be prepared is to revere Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. Amen? Every day of your life, you exalt Christ. You live for him. You, you love him. You give your heart and your life to him, your time, your talents, your treasure. You, you spend time in the word each and every day and allow the spirit to work in your heart and let him make you a fisher of men. And also, folks, know the reason for the hope you have. How many of you have the hope of eternal life? I like the word certainty even better. Not just hope, certainty on the authority of the Word of God. And God always honors His promises, doesn't He? He always honors His promises. Where did Paul meet people in order to share Christ with them? Walmart. This is what I like to say. So he reasoned in the synagogue. With, with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in Walmart, day by day. I, I do more pastoral calling in Walmart than a lot of places. I, I see a lot of you in Walmart. But you just hang out where the people are, amen? When, you, when you're out there in, in public and day by day with those who happen to be there, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. So, folks, the answer to this question is very simply this. In the synagogue, 
Okay? So, yeah, at church or in home Bible studies or wherever like that, in the marketplace, when you go to the store, in Walmart, or wherever, the gas station, or Bashes, or Safeway, or wherever you happen to be, publicly, house to house. In other words, pretty much wherever you are. Pretty much wherever you are, you're praying, Lord, is there someone that you're going to lead me to, or you're going to lead someone to me? If you are if you are, are, are primed by the Spirit when you wake up in the morning and you get ready to go out in the marketplace or wherever you go, if you would, would allow the Holy Spirit and say, Lord Jesus, I'm available. I have that hope. I have been saved. I know that if I breathe my last breath today, I'll be with you for all eternity. And you have that hope within you. And you say, Lord, I'm available. How many of you think the Lord's going to honor that? He's going to honor that. And he might just bring someone to you. And you don't even have to, you don't even have to do the initiating the conversation. He'll bring them to you if you're available. And you're ready to share. And you have that hope within you and you're being that witness. But if you wake up and you're grumpy and you're mad at the world, and you're mad at the politics, and you're mad at this, and mad at that, and you're mad at people, and somebody cuts you off, and then, then you're probably not going to be much of a witness. Amen? But if you're prepared, if you're ready, if you're available, and you have a deep love for Jesus, and you revere him as the Lord of your life, and regardless of the circumstances of this life, your hope is in Christ, you're going to be a witness. And chances are you're going to be leading somebody to faith in Jesus because they're going to see in you what they're looking for. So why must your witness center on Christ? Why is it so important that we center on Christ? What did Jesus say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That pretty much answers the question that people will say, well, there are many, many ways to God. There are many, many, many ways to God. Many religions all lead you to God. But what did Jesus say? I am the way. The truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So why must your witness center on Jesus? It's simple, because Jesus is the only way. And if you don't believe that, then you're probably not going to be a witness for Jesus, a true witness for Jesus. If in your heart you believe that there are many, many other ways, then God can't use you. But if you understand that they must come to faith in Jesus. How many other people and religions have someone that died to save you? Most other religions of the world, in fact, all other religions of the world are based on what you do personally and to earn your way to God. But Jesus paid the way already so that we can come to the Father. Amen? He is the only way Salvation is found in no one else, the Scripture says, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is only one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Number 13, as a witness for Christ, what should your message be to those without Christ? We've, we've gone over this already when I shared with you about your personal testimony, but let's do it again real quick. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What should your message be to those without Christ? Simply this, the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life. Okay? In Christ Jesus. Okay? I shared with you the bridge. The instructions are on the table in the back. The bridge presentation. You can help somebody simply with one verse of Scripture. Romans 
The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you can share the gospel with that one simple message. So as a witness for Christ, what should your message be to those without Christ? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? All have sinned. You need to help people to understand we're all born separated from God, fallen. Okay? All fall short of God's standard. We all like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah 53, 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of it us all. That's good news, isn't it? The Lord laid all of the sins of all the entire human race on Jesus when he paid that death penalty for us on that cross. So what should your message be to those without Christ? All have gone astray. All have gone our own way. But God laid all of our iniquities on Jesus. Amen? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. So once again, what should your message be? Everyone who receives Jesus and believes in his name, God gives the right to become his children. Number 14, after a person has accepted Christ, what is your responsibility to that person, according to Acts 14? They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. This is what, why follow-up is so important. So our responsibility is simply this. We need to make sure that they are strengthened in their faith and encouraged to remain true in the faith. Praise the Lord. And an, an effective witness or a testimony includes these three elements. We, uh, we went over this already. What your life was like before you became a Christian, how you became a Christian, how you came to believe in Jesus, and what Christ has done in your life. What did he do? How did he change you? So uh, I encourage you to, if you haven't done so already, to write out your testimony. If you don't have a testimony, then talk to the Lord so that you will have a testimony and it's real in you. And then finally, list the names of three people that you know who need Christ. Everybody knows somebody who are lost and they are separated from God and they need to know Jesus and you begin praying for them. Now commit to pray for them, realizing that God's grace is already at work. How many of you believe that God is like a hound dog in heaven chasing after people, trying to draw people to him? Amen? He is, he is after people. He is Holy Spirit is after people. He is actively trying to draw people unto himself. And as, even as hard as they tried to refuse and run away, God's going to still be after them until hopefully they make a decision, hopefully the right decision. But, in, but it's important for us to pray that God will provide an opportunity not only for them to come to know, but for you to witness to them. Although you, although you know you must tell others about Jesus, you may be afraid to do so. This is one of the biggest things that I encounter with people is they're afraid. They're afraid to share the gospel. They're afraid that they might be rejected. They're afraid that they might be ridiculed or put down or persecuted. Jesus was persecuted. In fact, they nailed him to a cross. How many of you are willing even to face persecution for the sake of the gospel because you know it's true and you're willing? So you might be afraid, knowing that God's grace is present before you, before you say anything helps. So that's the first thing. You know that God is already after people, all right? But where will you get the power to speak out despite your fear? That's what next week is all about. Bait in the hook. Amen? Our memory verse is, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Is this helpful?
I know it's a lot of material to cover and we're taking time, but I think it's important if you become familiar with these tools yourself, then you will more likely be willing to lead somebody else, not only to faith in Jesus, but know how to disciple them because you have tools. I have plenty of these available for you. If you want to have a, 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 a copy of them and carry it with you in your car or in your Bible or whatever, I have these available for you so that when you lead somebody to faith in Jesus, you'll already be ready to disciple them as well. And that's why we're doing this. Praise the Lord. Stand with me and let's sing to the glory of God. So thankful that you're here today. Jesus is the answer. Let's sing it together. Here we go. Jesus is the answer. you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you great peace. Be with us now as we go, Lord. I pray that there will be opportunities that we are able to share the gospel and that we are so confident in the power of the Holy Spirit, not only of our own testimony of what you've done in our lives, but confident to share that grace with others. The world needs Jesus these days, so be with us and help us to be a part of the Great Commission. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hope to see you at 4 o'clock this afternoon.